This video looks at a war movie that is considered to be quietly excellent. It's a dark, satirical take on one of the most infamous episodes in military history. The film is a faithful adaptation of Cecil Woodham Smith's book, The Reason Why. This book is a merciless expose of the terrible failings of the British Army in the Crimea and the film takes exactly the same tone. It was helmed by a successful director, well known for his anti-establishment views. It portrays the British Empire and its army as inflexible, class-obsessed and outdated. It portrays the British Army Officer Corps as incompetent, exclusively upper class and idiotic. And as the title states, it culminates in one of the worst military blunders, certainly in the 19th century and in military history itself. It is 1968's The Charge of the Light Brigade. For me, this is one of the best war films ever made. And if you're asking yourself, well, why haven't I heard of it then? It's probably because it bombed at the box office upon release. But then again, so did Blade Runner, The Shawshank Redemption and The Rocky Horror Picture Show. Success at the box office doesn't necessarily a good film make. The combination of an excellent script, great performances from well-known actors, amazingly detailed costumes, epic battles and a very dark sense of humour all contribute to a quietly excellent war film and it has since gained a strong critical reputation in subsequent decades. The director Tony Richardson's resume includes 25 films, 20 TV series or TV films and 42 theatre productions. His most successful film Tom Jones was the most popular comedy of its day and won four Oscars including Best Picture and Best Director in 1964. Tony was part of the new wave kitchen sink movement, films which were defined by anti-authoritarian protagonists and no-nonsense betrayals of working class life. In 1966, Tony financed the escape of a Russian double agent called George Blake from HMP Wormwood Scrubs in the United Kingdom. This was a huge embarrassment to the British government at the time, and how he got away with it without doing prison time himself, I have absolutely no idea. This was something you could probably only get away with in the swinging 60s. Following this defiant act, there was no better person to direct a satire about the British Empire than Tony, it seems. David Hemmings appeared in over 50 films with his breakout role in the controversial film Blow Up, which won a Palme d'Or at Cannes in 1966. Hemmings also portrayed the evil Dr. Charles Moffat in several episodes of one of my favourite 1980s series, Airwolf. He also had several appearances in and also directed episodes of two other 80s cult TV series, Magnum P.I. and The A-Team. His later, more noticeable film appearances were in Gladiator in 2000, the quietly excellent dystopian film Equilibrium and Gangs of New York in 2002, and in 2003's deeply disappointing and a complete insult to the source material, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Hemmings portrays the controversial Captain Lewis Nolan, who hand-delivered the order which initiated the doom charge of the Light Brigade. Trevor Howard was well known for playing authoritarian roles and during his career he played up rumours that he had won a military cross during World War II. However, in a 2001 biography it was revealed that he was in fact dismissed from the British Army in 1943 due to having a psychopathic personality. Howard starred alongside the now legendary Orson Welles in 1949's The Third Man and he portrayed the cruel Captain Bly battling Marlon Brando's Fletcher Christian in 1962's classic, The Mutiny on the Bounty. His portrayal of the aristocratic Lord Cardigan is so appalling and comically vile that at times he almost invokes Joffrey levels of hatred whilst one watches him. He was obviously channeling some of that unstable psychopathology whilst playing this role and was rightly nominated for a BAFTA for it in 1969. Oh, Blackguard, what do you whisper? I am ashamed that you're not polite to our rank, my lord. We are your own officers. Officer! Paymaster! Do you mean paymaster? That ain't a rank! It's a trade! Harry Andrews, like Trevor Howard, had a significant film and TV career appearing in over 80 films. Unlike Trevor Howard, however, he did actually serve during World War II in one of the oldest regiments in military history, the Honourable Artillery Company. He served during the D-Day landings and was mentioned in dispatches for gallant and distinguished service in Northwest Europe and was demobilised with the rank of Major. 
Andrew's best known roles include The Battle of Britain, Hawk the Completely Awesome Slayer, Superman, Moby Dick, and the classic Ice Cold in Alex. Perhaps his best known role was as the voice of the frightening, cruel, and tyrannical General Woundwort in 1978's animated classic Watership Down, a film which forever traumatised millions of children around the globe, and doubtless many adults as well, with its depiction of cute, fluffy bunnies literally ripping each other to pieces. Andrews portrays Lord Lucan, commander of the British cavalry. He is also the brother-in-law of Lord Cardigan, who he utterly despises. Cardigan! Sir John Gilgood needs little introduction as he, Ralph Richardson and Laurence Olivier were the holy trinity that dominated British stage and film for much of the 20th century. He was considered one of the best performers of his generation, particularly as a Shakespearean actor. His major roles include Richard III, Murder by Decree, The Elephant Man, Chariots of Fire, Gandhi and Elizabeth in 1999. He won an Oscar, an Emmy, a Grammy and Tony Award and was one of only a few people to have won all four of these major awards. Gilgood portrays the elderly, amiable, indecisive and at times slightly confused general of the British Army, Lord Raglan. Not at all pretty. <laughs> a young lady should concern themselves with what is pretty. England is pretty. Babies are pretty. Some table linen can be very pretty. <clears throat> the film starts with Punch magazine style animations representing the British media of the day. These depict Britain as an industrial, military and technological wonder. Enter Captain Nolan, recently returned from India, eager to join the Light Brigade and also reunited with his best friend Harry. Nolan attends Harry's picturesque and distinctly upper class wedding to his new beautiful wife Clarissa. The lovely wedding then smashed cuts to the reality of a Victorian slum where illiterate, destitute and desperate men are promised a new and much better life by joining Her Majesty's Light Brigade. And on their first day of enlistment, the harsh reality of army life for the common man is immediately impressed upon them. Their squalid shared barracks regularly sees drunkenness, theft and violence all in front of the other common soldiers and their families. The film smash cuts again to the privileged upper class officers experience of army life which is positively luxurious compared to its poor common soldiers. We see the splendour, decadence and luxury of a well to do officers ball. Clarissa and Nolan's morally uneasy relationship continues to quietly develop into an affair right under the nose of Nolan's best friend and Clarissa's new poor husband Harry. Nolan intervenes upon seeing a cruel and dangerous joke played on a young, inexperienced officer by his peers at the officer's mess. He demonstrates his equinine skill by easily calming an irate horse and saving a young man from almost certain injury. The onlooking Lord Cardigan does not like this one bit and shames the officer who initiated the cruel joke. He berates him in front of his fellows, not for playing a cruel joke, but for being made to look stupid by Nolan's valiant actions. Nolan, it seems, is already on a collision course with Lord Cardigan. A formal dinner at the officer's mess devolves into a shouting match between Nolan and Lord Cardigan. It's due to a misunderstanding about the serving of a bottle of wine that looks like a common beer bottle at a champagne-only dinner. The newspapers publish the now infamous Black Bottle story, resulting in the constant mockery of Lord Cardigan and the British Army by the public, and requires the General-in-Chief of the Army to intervene. The British public, backed by propaganda from its newspapers, starts clamouring for war after Imperial Russia invades Turkey, threatening Europe's trade routes to the New World. Preparing to take Britain to war, the incompetent general of its army Lord Raglan mistakenly appoints Lords Lucan and Cardigan to positions in the cavalry. This would prove to be a terrible and costly mistake on his part, despite him knowing of their historic loathing of one another. The inland march by the British army arriving in the Crimea is hampered by the devastating and avoidable occurrence of an outbreak of sickness and disease. It is a strong testament to the poor management and leadership of the British officers and many soldiers' lives are needlessly lost before they've even entered battle. Despite its incompetence in leadership, the British infantry successfully engages the Russians, 
watched by the commanders of the cavalry who desperately want to take part in the fighting. Captain Nolan delivers the handwritten order from Lord Raglan to Lord Lucan for the Light Brigade to retrieve British cannon taken by Russian troops. The order is misinterpreted and the Light Brigade end up charging head-on towards well-defended heavy artillery, whilst receiving musket fire from both sides. The film ends with the incompetent commanders arguing who is at fault and blaming each other for the absolute slaughter. They appear oblivious to the few survivors emerging slowly from the smoke and carnage. Nolan is portrayed accurately as a professional and experienced soldier and author of a well-regarded book on cavalry tactics. Also, unlike a vast majority of his fellow officers in the Light Brigade, Nolan actually had extensive cavalry experience from his posting in India. Unfortunately, this experience was looked down upon by senior army staff despite their own lack of experience. He is no friend of his subordinate troops either, but is quietly horrified with the poor leadership and structure of the so-called modern British army. Nolan is also morally flawed, and the script deconstructs his character by showing him to be capable of the worst type of betrayal. Reacquainted with his best friend Harry and attending his picturesque wedding to Clarissa, Nolan quietly embarks on a passionate affair with her behind his best friend's back. He then happily leaves the uncomfortable situation and England for the war in the Crimea. We learn that Clarissa is pregnant, but by Nolan or her husband, we're not entirely sure. His flaws as an officer are demonstrated by his indifference to the common enlisted men, and his growing hot-headedness and belligerence towards his ineffectual, superior officers. The former is showcased when Nolan is confronted by an almost certainly mortally wounded soldier in the aftermath of a battle. In pushing him away, Nolan knocks the injured man roughly to the ground. The latter, in seeing him passing the order to attack to Lord Lucan, and Nolan indicating in anger and indignation the wrong Russian target. The reason why the Light Brigade charged and was nearly destroyed is laid directly at the feet of Captain Nolan and his emotionally compromised state. Lord Cardigan gives us a blustery introduction to who he is, and more importantly, his Light Brigade. I do not propose to recount my life in any detail. What is what? No damn business of anyone what is what. I am Lord Cardigan, that is what. A brigade of 600 soldiers he personally spends £10,000 a year to clothe, equip and provide new horses to. The equivalent of approximately £1.3 million today. And he makes it crystal clear that his cherry bums, as he calls them, are his well-dressed personal property and the brigade itself is his own private fiefdom. Cardigan is portrayed as the antithesis of a competent commanding officer. He is more concerned about the behaviour of his officers being aristocratic, flamboyant and stylish rather than improving their abilities and combat efficacy. He is far more focused on how others perceive his officers and by extension, how they perceive him. We also see the infamous and very true account of the Black Bottle incident with Captain Nolan replacing the real Captain John Reynolds. Cardigan had banned the consumption of Porter beer, a popular beverage with the professional officers as he thought it common. At a formal dinner at the officers' mess, a guest had ordered Moselle wine, which was served in a bottle similar to the now banned Porter beer. You are drinking beer, sir. Porter beer. Cardigan decided that Captain Nolan, who had ordered it on a guest's behalf, had defied his order and has him arrested for it. Nevertheless, Cardigan, his regiment and the commander-in-chief of the army were subject to ridicule, hissing and catcalls of Black Bottle whenever they appeared in public. Cardigan orders a sergeant major to spy on Nolan as part of their ongoing feud. The senior NCO refuses such a dishonourable order and Cardigan instantly strips him of the rank it took him 20 years to obtain. The now demoted sergeant major, perhaps understandably, reports drunk for inspection the next day and as punishment, Cardigan has him flogged for it. This has to be one of Trevor Howard's finest roles and his portrayal of Cardigan is unabashedly outrageous, 
horrendous and aristocratically ignorant. If all that was wrong with the British aristocracy and its empire could be personified by one character in film, it would be Lord Cardigan. If that line's straight, I'm a Turk's ass. The real Lord Lucan had ruthlessly evicted thousands of his tenants from the land he owned in Ireland during the Irish famine, no less. Due to this, he was understandably loathed by the Irish and was known as the Exterminator. Not a nice nickname to have been given by an entire country people in the 21st century, let alone in the 19th. Lucan had married Cardigan's sister, Anne, and there was an opinion that he had mistreated her. Hence, Cardigan's hatred of Lucan. Lucan detested Cardigan as, and I quote, a loose living idiot not worthy of a Queen's commission. As his commanding officer, Lucan attempts to keep a tight rein on Cardigan whilst they're in the Crimea, but finds this difficult with Cardigan disregarding any orders he can get away with. Are you ordered up? I'm going up in a... Their personal squabbling and pettiness is betrayed in a scene with one arranging the troops' tents to be set in a row, only for the other to arrive shortly afterwards and ordering them to be redeployed, stating that they were not in a straight enough line. Get them down! Get them down and start again! Childish and petty behaviours from two senior officers and an example of their real-life bickering and animosity which actually took place on campaign. Lord Raglan had lost an arm at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815 where Europe finally defeated Napoleon Bonaparte. Lord Raglan served as the secretary to the now legendary Duke of Wellington but had none of his experience, skill and certainly none of his tactical ability. Raglan appears to have more in common with Joe Biden than the Duke of Wellington. I do urge you to keep your head here. It's your only protection against the sun. Throughout the campaign, he has to be reminded that the French are not the enemy, but are in fact Britain's allies, casting serious doubts as to his mental competency in leading the entire British army. We're surrounded the French then in the yard. Our allies, my lord. He also comes to rapidly dislike the more than competent Captain Nolan, stating of him... That young man, Nolan. I don't really like him. He rides too well. Knows a lot, but he has no heart. It'll be a sad day, Eddie, when England has our armies officered by men who know too well what they're doing. Smacks of murder. Fanny Dubilly is one of the few wives allowed to accompany their husbands on campaign to the Crimea. She is not so quietly obsessed with Lord Cardigan and behaves like an adolescent Harry Styles fan when she sees him. She is depicted as a feather-brained floozy who spends most of the film trying to bed Lord Cardigan. She is eventually successful and we see what is possibly the most unromantic and passionless seduction scene ever committed to film. In reality, however, she was a tough-minded, adventurous woman who was endlessly faithful to her husband and wrote an account of her Crimea experiences which is free to access online. Having decisively beat Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, England's hegemony remained unopposed for over 40 years. It had not fought a campaign in Europe for the same time period, however, and was subsequently outdated, overly bureaucratic, and still clinging to outmoded methods of warfare. With the return to peace at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, military expenditure was heavily reduced. As a result, the regular army was gradually slimmed down from 230,000 men to 91,000 by 1838. In 1853, new recruits had to be quickly trained and shipped to the Crimea, with many of Britain's best soldiers still serving in India. The British army in the Crimea was not of the best quality, to say the least. The supply service had not been reformed since the end of the Napoleonic Wars and was ill-equipped to move and supply an army of 30,000 men. When the British Army first landed, it had no adequate equipment for it, no winter clothes, no food and no tents. The army had no intelligence of the enemy and actually didn't have any maps of the interior of the Crimea either. It had no details whatsoever to plan any type of military strategy upon its arrival. 
most of the seriously wounded soldiers were simply left on the battlefield as they were too mutilated to move. Injuries that weren't of a serious nature could still often prove fatal as they would remain untreated for lengthy periods of time. The injured soldiers simply succumbing to blood loss, infection and the harsh weather conditions. In short, there was no transport system in place to move the wounded for treatment, resulting in terrible and totally unnecessary fatalities. This horrible practice of abandoning the wounded was historically used by both sides. There were a combined 730,000 men, British, French and Russian combatants in the Crimea theatre of war three quarters of a million men. 34,000 of these were killed in action, 26,000 died from wounds, and 130,000 died from disease, chief of which was cholera. Only one in six of all deaths in the Crimean War were actually caused by battle. These quite horrible statistics are distilled down into a scene depicting the British march inland after having arrived near Sevastopol. Disease quickly rips through the ranks of the troops, killing a great many men, common soldiers and officers alike. The terrible and unnecessary loss of life is met with complete indifference from its officers in the film, as it was historically. Cholera, my lord. Eleven men have died and there are more. Damn, Damn cholera, what you call it. We're not here to drop dead in the vapours like girls. The ignorance and limitations of the British Empire are exposed by its class-obsessed society and in particular the structure of its army. And this is where the anti-establishment, working-class views of the director, Tony Richardson, really do shine. Remember, this was a time where women gaining the right to vote was to come about over 60 years later. To be an officer, you would have to be of the wealthy upper class or landed aristocracy. That is to say, you must have come from money. There were a few exceptions to this, however. Money enabled promotion to higher officers to be bought instead of being earned, a process known as the purchase system. The foolhardy and dangerous nature of this system meant senior officers who were responsible for the welfare and lives of the many men they commanded were very often not competent to do so. They did not possess the skill sets and experience that we would expect nowadays and subsequently this made many of them dangerous to their own troops. You were not promoted on the basis of merit, but rather if you were born into a rich family and could financially afford it. One contemporary commented of both Cardigan and Lucan that if they had enlisted as privates, neither would have gained promotion to corporal. Sadly, these wealthy, inexperienced officers promoted themselves over more experienced and able, but less wealthy colleagues. The outright incompetence of these born rich but inexperienced officers are ably demonstrated in several notable scenes. Sir George Brown refusing to respond to the Russians overrunning a British-held redoubt and dragging away the cannon. This inaction actually results in the doomed light brigade charge as they are ordered to retrieve the guns but instead charge the wrong target. Sir George Brown refuses to act until he's and had his Lord breakfast. Has not been in the trenches all night. Sit down and have some breakfast. I will not sit down, sir. Not? Lord Raglan refusing to take advantage of a Russian deserter's news of an imminent Russian attack the next day. Lord Raglan, or perhaps I should say Lord Biden, instead tells him off for betraying his own side and asks him what his own mother would think of his actions if she knew. Come here as a traitor. I hope you're without a mother. But she should hear of this. The sight of elderly senior officers with little or no battle experience greedily gulping up army command assignments like hungry pupils at a posh British boarding school. Lords Lucan and Raglan taunting each other like a pair of unruly schoolboys who've had a fight in the playground years ago and have hated each other ever since. Draw your horse around your ears. Bring your head out of his ass. All of the senior commanding officers in the Crimea were over the age of 60, with none having any actual combat experience. A scene which demonstrates their advanced ages is when the general of the French army up and dies in Lord Raglan's lap with an outstanding punchline from Raglan. Ah. I told you he wasn't well, Eric. The very comfortable anti-intellectual army lifestyle enjoyed by the officers is sharply contrasted throughout the film 
with the squalid reality of being a poor common or enlisted man. They are recruited, or perhaps targeted being a better term, from the slums where the chances of improving one's standing and quality of life were absolutely minimal. These desperate men are promised advancement, independence, regular pay and a chance to see the world. However, upon enlistment, what they actually get is poor or sometimes irregular pay and squalid living conditions for themselves and their families. They also receive brutal and arbitrary punishment for the smallest infraction of the rules and the very real chance of a painful death. And usually, not a glorious soldier's death on the battlefield surrounded by the bodies of one's vanquished foes, but rather an ignominious and rather banal death from sickness or disease. One of the most clever additions to this film is the utilisation of punch-inspired animations to provide ironic State of the Nation commentary. Punch magazine started in 1841 and mocked social and political issues with satirical cartoons and its descendants are still in effect today. These animated sequences appear throughout the film to forward the exposition and are both wonderfully inventive and wickedly delicious. They highlight the propaganda being fed to the British public and how the British Empire perceived itself in the context of the wider world. That is, as the world's policeman and Queen Victoria as an almost godlike figure of purity and justice. The animations depict Imperial Russia as a bear menacing Turkey, which is initially depicted as a turkey and then as a beautiful damsel in need of rescuing. The majestic English line and its ally France then rise to thwart Imperial Russia's diabolical expansion. This is also one of the few films to hold the media, in this case the English newspapers of the day, accountable for their actions. Instead of calling for deliberations and a halt to the madness that must inevitably lead to war with Imperial Russia, the press is shown deliberately whipping the British nation into a war frenzy. This phenomena is still very much in existence today, given added gravitas with contemporary technology. An absolute first for any war was that journalist William Howard Russell was embedded in the Crimea and was able to rapidly communicate his reports via telegram back to London. News from the Crimea could reach Britain within 24 hours. For the first time in history, swiftly bringing news and the realities of war to readers at home. The scriptwriter Charles Wood's exquisite use of the period vernacular renders the dialogue eccentric, hilarious, authentically Victorian sounding and a constant delight to the ear. At times I'm so pent up with their languor I could scruff hold of any two of them and bang their noddles together till their doodles drop off. The language used in Great Britain nearly 170 years ago sounds very different compared to today. Fanny, hello! I promised to help us call her Bob. Fanny! Fanny. The weapons, the hairstyles, dresses, sets, and in particular the uniforms are all rendered in exquisite detail. At times, this film rivals others such as Barry Lyndon and the Duelists for its historically accurate environments and visual period beauty. Due to Sir George Brown's bloody late breakfast, the Russians had overrun a British redoubt and started to drag away the captured British artillery. Lord Raglan, conscious that the Duke of Wellington had never lost any guns in such a manner, issues an order for the Light Brigade to ride the Russians down and recapture the guns. Lord Luke and the cavalry will advance on the French, the, the, the Russians, immediately. They will be supported by the infantry, which has already been ordered to advance on two fronts. Has it? Delivering this order to Lord Lucan, Captain Nolan becomes infuriated with his questions and delays as Lucan cannot see the guns being dragged away from his position. Nolan then yells at Lucan and in his anger motions indeterminately in the direction of the order's target. Lucan, however, then sees only the heavy artillery battery and knows he cannot refuse an order. With rare politeness to his hated enemy Cardigan, he then relays the order to attack. Cardigan, realising the gravity of what was to happen next, replies with equally unusual politeness. I suggest, Lord Cardigan, you advance steadily, keep your men well in hand. If the brigade is handled with control, there should be no useless or unnecessary loss. <coughs> Certainly, sir. 
But allow me to point out to you that the Russians have guns in the valley and batteries and riflemen on each flank. It is contrary to all practice of war for cavalry to charge artillery from the front. You are quite right, sir. But uh, what choice have we? And so into the valley of death slowly cantered the 600. Nolan receives permission to join the regiment's charge and happily falls in. But shortly after this, he realises the terrible mistake about to be made. He desperately attempts to alert both Cardigan and the rest of the men who are about to charge the incorrect and very heavily defended wrong target. The Russian gunners' looks of incredulity and utter disbelief neatly sum up the almost suicidal nature of the charge. Captain Godfrey Morgan and other witnesses observed that Captain Nolan was the first to be killed by shrapnel from a Russian shell. They all confirmed that he screamed upon being hit, extended his arms and then suddenly dropped quite dead off his horse. The brigade charged the mile and one quarter distance to the artillery whilst receiving cannon fire from the front and musket fire to its flanks. The main frontal Russian guns fired at point-blank range with canister shot when the brigade was near. The front rank of charging men and horses were essentially disintegrated. The brigade reached and sabred the gun crews, forcing them to fall back. But having run out of momentum, the light brigade, or at least what's left of it, were then charged by Russian lancers. They then rapidly retreated back to their own lines along with the somewhat unjustly unharmed Lord Cardigan. Shortly afterwards, Lords Lucan, Raglan and Cardigan set to arguing as to who was at fault for the doomed charge. They are seemingly unconcerned at the sight of the horrendously wounded soldiers returning from the absolute carnage right before their very eyes. Cardigan is especially livid regarding Nolan's behaviour and is unconcerned to learn that he is dead or that he has just rode over Nolan's body. Nolan! That Indian! Insolent, miserable-ass mutineer! My lord, you have just ridden over his dead body. Has anyone seen my regiment? We then see the Valley of Death strewn with dead and dying soldiers and their poor horses. Historically, the Light Brigade was then counter-charged by Russian and Cossack lancers and had to run the gauntlet again to get back to the British lines. The French chasseurs de Freak cleared the Russian artillery from one of the brigade's flanks, saving them from its fire. In the end, of the roughly 670 light brigade soldiers who charged, 118 men were killed, 127 were wounded, and about 60 were taken prisoner. Approximately 40% losses, which was completely unacceptable for achieving very little. The brigade had lost approximately 375 horses and after regrouping only 195 men still had their mounts. French Marshal Pierre Boscat stated of the charge, it is magnificent but it is not war. The Russian commanders are said to have initially believed that the entire brigade must have been drunk. General Leprandi, inspecting men of the light brigade taken prisoner afterwards, asked them in English, what did they give you to drink? Alfred Tennyson dramatised the charge into a romantic poem, capturing the imagination of the British public who thought of the Light Brigade as heroes. It would take Cecil Woodham Smith's book released 99 years later to reveal the true nature and terrible incompetence of this infamous event. Prior to her book, if you can believe it, the reputation of the British cavalry was significantly enhanced as a result of the charge. Historically, Cardigan quickly journeyed back to his yacht, the Dryad, anchoring in the bay nearby, and had a champagne dinner that very night. He was seen as a hero by the British public and was made Inspector General of Cavalry and was appointed Knight Commander of the Order of the Bath in 1855. Lord Lucan was initially blamed for the charge, but successfully acquitted himself in a speech to the House of Lords in 1855. In his speech, he blamed both Lord Raglan and the now deceased Captain Nolan for the doomed charge. And this tactic seemed to work. He was then made Knight Commander of the Order of the Bath the very same year. Lord Raglan, the incompetent general, died of dysentery eight months later following the charge while still on campaign. 
the public were outraged at the dire circumstances of the British soldiers and their lack of proper medical treatment. This compelled the government to dispatch Florence Nightingale and her nursing team to the Crimea. Nightingale's involvement and presence in the Crimea, along with the sadly underlooked Mary Seacole, thankfully revolutionised battlefield treatment for the sick and wounded. Photographer Roger Fenton also provided visual evidence, capturing for the first time in history first-rate images of the British Army, or any army for that matter, at war. And finally, in 1871, Parliament was able to abolish purchase commissions, and promotions were based on merit after that. This is a rare film indeed, as it mocks the British Empire and its ineffectual aristocratic leadership, but does so with a straight face. There is no slapstick or silly humour. The laughs come from subtle and sometimes terrible situations where ineptitude and ridiculous behaviours were unfortunately quite normal. This movie is strongly recommended to any fan of military history, as its anti-establishment director has no interest in distorting the facts in trying to glorify its subject matter. Such is its visual and historical quality that you certainly cannot tell that it was made in the late 1960s. Its ongoing strength, like any good historical film, is that it continues to look timeless. Thanks very much for listening. Please like and subscribe.